This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. My guest today is Taro Isakapala from Finland. My first guest from Finland, as far as I know. And he has a great backstory. A former nomad turned mushroom-loving foodpreneur. Yeah, this one is completely outside the box for my podcast. Well, hold on. Maybe it's not so outside the box. I'm outside the box. I want to be outside the box. Tara's goal is bringing back the ancient mushroom wisdom to our modern lifestyle. So not only is this conversation going to be about mushrooms and all the benefits, something new to me, but also the launching of a company, a really successful company that is growing and taking off. Boom. You got to love those two things, bringing in a piece of wisdom about food that can help us all and watching from afar, learning from an entrepreneur who is hitting the gas to the floor and taking off. I hope you enjoy this conversation with Taro and let's jump right in. I want to take you back in time, though, because, you know, if I was to imagine we're going to talk about mushrooms today, one of the things we're going to talk about, a main thing we're going to talk about, if I was to go back in time and think about my experience with mushrooms, perhaps my mother cooking the standard issue mushrooms, you know, in the kitchen uh, growing up in the suburbs outside Washington, D.C. Now, in the last few years, I've had a chance to spend a lot of time in Southeast Asia. And for example, in a place like Vietnam, my gosh, the mushroom is, you know, is used and utilized in cooking uh, dramatically different. I mean, you know, you can go find a, a soup around Saigon and there might be 10 or 15 different types of mushrooms in it. Very, very different than something you might experience in the States. And I can think about flavors of mushrooms as, I, as I've gotten older and appreciate and stuff like that. But that's about it. You know, that's unfortunately and sadly about it. So I start to read your background. I'm like, oh, wow, okay. And the first thing that strikes me, and this is where I'd like to start, is let you to really get to lay, before we dive into more of your world and where you've taken things, the properties of mushrooms. For me to have the reminder of something like, oh my gosh, penicillin. Maybe you know this as a kid, you know it in high school, you know it in college, but as you get older, you forget these things. Let's talk about some of what mushrooms have given to humanity. Mushrooms or fungi are a kingdom. When something is a kingdom, there is a lot of diversity. So if you think of the kingdom of animals or kingdom of plants or kingdom of bacteria, there's many kinds of bacteria, good and bad. And the same goes for fungi. So just thinking of a portobello mushroom is quite limiting Nobody really knows how many mushrooms there are, but the estimates are around 1.5 million. Out of those 1.5 million, we've only discovered a fraction of them, but let's assume that that's true. That would mean that there's six times more different kinds of mushrooms in the world than there are plants. Six times. So for every tomato, there's six different kinds of mushrooms. So the diversity is pretty insane. What have they given to the world? I mean, mushrooms create a lot of the topsoil. So topsoil is needed for plants to grow and uh, almost all plants and so anything you eat in the plant kingdom but also the trees and the bushes require mushrooms to collect water and nutrients so plants wouldn't really exist without mushrooms Uh, mushrooms are used for a lot of food products so from beer to wine to bread to cheese those are kind of more the common ones but also the culinary mushrooms are great source of essential vitamins and nutrients and we can talk about those at detail and then there's these functional mushrooms that offer even more superfood type benefits and then there's psychedelic mushrooms and some argue that we learned how to speak and become homo sapiens with the help of psychedelic mushrooms be that true or not that's that world and there's the pharmaceuticals about 40 percent of pharmaceuticals 
utilize fungi. And you mentioned one of the more famous one, penicillin, but there is out of the 20 best selling drugs, about 10 is set to contain mushrooms. So there's a lot of medicinal benefits and environmental benefits. Mushrooms can eat plastic or remove oil spills. So there's a lot of potential with fungi already that has been discovered and more gets discovered all the time. So it's almost a little hard to know where to start. I hear you on that. And I have to say, which is given the breadth, the depth that you've just kind of outlined at a really kind of cursory level, it's really interesting. And I want your perspective here that you're kind of inventing a category that people have not really focused on. Meaning, of course, yes, you you outline the all the benefits and, and rationales as to why fungi mushrooms are so important to us. But in terms of awareness, the awareness part, isn't it an interesting feeling that you get to walk into a space where you look around and you say, my gosh, these fungi mushrooms, so important to us, so important to the world, but the conversation is just not there. What a fun feeling for you as an entrepreneur and as somebody who wants to educate and help to walk into a space where there's just not a lot of people playing your game. In all fairness, there is a lot of people playing the game. It's just not visible for the masses or mainstream, I would say. That's what I mean. I mean, for me, I'm not thinking about mushrooms on a, on a daily basis, but then I see your world and I'm seeing what you're doing. And I'm like, oh, wow. I guess to partly tie it to a lot of the other topics that you've discussed on trend following is in order to do business or educate, you have to find undiscovered or unappreciated value. And it's pretty fair to say that the fungal kingdom, if they're part of half of the best selling drugs or 40% of all pharmaceuticals and they can eat plastic and clean oil spills and they have all these health promoting benefits that we can use for better cognitive function or skin or immunity. But not a lot of people think about them that probably argue that there is unappreciated value or, or overlooked value. And as an entrepreneur or an educator, the whole point is discovering value that other people don't know and then spreading that to others. And then the value gets spread and, and then you will hopefully also benefit, but the common collective also benefits. Let me take you back in time. Before we start to get into all the nitty gritty, I want to know the foundation. So, you know, we're going back a uh, family farm. It's been in your family for 13 generations, I believe. And you as a young guy growing up foraging for mushrooms is just part of being in the family and whatnot. Now that's a quite different experience from someone like me. So, I mean, I'm having to vicariously imagine as a young boy, instead of doing what I did as a young boy, imagine having the experience that you did. Why don't you explain that experience, some of your, your family ancestry and how you first became exposed to mushrooms. If there was an early story, an early experience, what was the conversion for you where you said, my gosh, this must be my life passion. And that might not have happened when you were 10. I get it. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up in Finland, uh, about two hours north of the capital. Often when I meet people, they ask, uh, where in Finland are you from? And then I ask, how many cities do you know in Finland? And so I'm no Helsinki, <laughs> but the area or the town where our farm is, is quite famous. It's called Nokia. And it's famous for obviously mobile phones where um, the Nokia technology and production empire back in the day started a long time ago but i grew up there and finland has been independent now 100 years and the farm has been over 13 generations so the farm has seen civil war and was 100 years under russian ruling and 600 years finland was part of sweden so that's why we're still bilingual both finnish and swedish growing up in a small country which very few people know is obviously very different and for multiple reasons. One is that you learn a lot of languages, you're more outward facing because you know that your country is tiny and relies so much on exports and being inclusive with the world versus exclusive with the world. So Finnish educational system is pretty good. And there's a lot of technology and a lot of understanding of the rest of the world, which I've only come to understand later that that's, that was special because when you grow up, you think it's normal. And as far as my background goes, growing up at the farm, it was a lot of hard work. Finland is quite cold and the climate is pretty harsh. So growing up in that setting and then basically through my, both of my parents are in the health, wellness, agriculture. So my dad is an agronomist and my mom is a teacher, professor in, in nursing, physiology and anatomy. And the early memory is me going to the forest. I was not school yet. So 
hard to know how old was I, but somewhere probably between three and five. And I would go with my mom and my brother, the forest, and we would pick up wild foods. And I loved, loved the berries, wild raspberries, wild blueberries. But then there was these peculiar characters, these mushrooms, these little like mini houses. And they were so different from all the herbs and berries because they were like a tiny house, you know, and they were slimy sometimes after the rain. And they were just so odd, you know, they would stick out. At that point, I wouldn't know, but they were just so fascinating. And then my father, who was, you know, a big hero of mine, a few of his favorite meals were around mushrooms. So that was what I remember at growing up. And then later I studied chemistry, nutrition, and discovered a rare mushroom and won an innovation award for it. And there was a lot of other stuff happened, but the early memory is just me forging with my brother and my mom in the forest and finding these mystical creatures. It's funny. I'm looking at your picture and I'm, it's reminding me of something. And you're, as you're talking about Finland, I'm pulling up the map. I'm 50% Lithuanian. My father's 100%. I have a ton of relatives that I would say, oh my gosh, okay. I'm looking at close proximity. I'm seeing a, a very similar looking feel. So not me. I got blended in with my mom. So I'm kind of half and half. So, but yeah, 50% Lithuania. Yeah, that's great. I've been there and for a long time, there was a big divide as Finland was longer independent than Latvia, Lithuania and Estonia. But there is a big connection there. We're all like next to uh, the big Russia and, and the impact of that. That'd be a whole different conversation to go down that historical sure, path. very much. <laughs> Quite be interesting to both of us, but uh, maybe that's for another day. Let me jump right into the heart of the matter. A functional mushroom. I don't know what a functional mushroom is. I'm guessing the vast majority of my audience does not know what a functional mushroom is. Let's break it apart there. I mean, obviously, that's going to be a big banner and a lot's going to come underneath it. But let's start there. The cliff notes. So how do we provide value to everybody listening? And how they become a mushroom expert in the next few minutes. So on a high level, there's obviously many kinds of mushrooms because it's a kingdom. Some of them are invisible. You can breathe in mushroom spores. You're not going to know. I mentioned that you can find them in bread, wine, beer, kombucha, in so many ways. But then the more common form is what is called the fruiting body. So when you go to the grocery store and you go to the area where you have these mushrooms, these sometimes they look like the common cap and a stem model. Sometimes they look different. But these are the fruiting bodies, and, and a lot of people associate mushrooms with them. And, and there's two kinds of main groups of mushrooms. There are culinary mushrooms, and then there's functional mushrooms. And, and the names, I think, is pretty indicative. Culinary mushrooms you eat mostly for the flavor only, and the functional mushrooms you eat mostly for their health benefits. That doesn't mean that the culinary mushrooms had no health benefits. Uh, they do. And then doesn't mean that the functional mushrooms do not taste great. And there's some overlap. So Common culinary mushrooms include like butter mushroom, morel, chanterelle, porcini, and shiitake, which is also a functional mushroom, which is kind of one of those that is in both buckets. And then the functional mushrooms might be shiitake, maitake, rishi, chaga, some more exotic, some more familiar. And the difference, generally speaking, is that culinary mushrooms grow on the ground, functional mushrooms grow on trees which is a lot of people don't realize. And, and then culinary mushrooms might have fiber and no cholesterol and some protein and some of those things. But then the functional mushrooms have incredibly high amounts of health beneficial compounds. They could be things like B vitamins, ripoflavin, niacin, pathogenic acid, things that are good for energy, skin, the eyes. Vitamin D is one of the only non-animal based sources for vitamin D is in mushrooms. There are minerals, there are these polysaccharides that support your immune system, and some of them are adaptogenic, which means they help your body to adapt to stressors. So they could help with gut health, brain function, other things. So they're more like a superfood, and the culinary mushrooms are more like another type of a vegetable, even though they're not a vegetable, but for how you would use them. So the reason is, the difference is just nutrient density, and the functional mushrooms are the most nutrient dense mushrooms in the world. You know, one of the, I was thinking is uh, before we started chatting today, I was thinking about habits that I've changed of mine in the last, let's say 10 or 15 years. One of the habits that I changed or, or started, I should say, is the consumption of non-sweetened green tea. I, I'm pretty much an, an addict for good or bad. I, I tend to think without being as scientific as you are about mushrooms, I tend to think that this has been a good addition 
to my daily routine for a long period of time. And I think as we start to weave this conversation, that's one of the tricks for people is to say, okay, this is really interesting. I get to hear some of these insights from Tarot, but how do I then take the step to blend it into my routine to make it part of my habit? And for example, and this is where I would love for you to kind of explain this, if we were to talk about something like gut health, most people, before we even get to the point of what your insight, your expertise would be to tell people why mushrooms can help on gut health, people probably don't even think about what gut health is or why they should be thinking about it. So why don't I give you the floor to kind of give people a little bit of that broad overview on gut health and how, for example, just to go in a great example, how fungi, how mushrooms can help. Yes, gut health is, in my books, one of the three most fundamental and unappreciated aspects of human physiology. The other ones are hormonal imbalances or hormonal balance and then immunity. And a lot of people misunderstand all three. But just to stick with the gut health, the gut is your second brain. And this is not just a catchphrase. This is quite literally your gut health is tied to a lot of the nervous system and how your brain works. So bad gut health could, for example, create inflammation in the body, could create brain fog, could create all kinds of rashes in your skin, discomfort. There's so many things that can happen because of good or bad gut health. Also, the absorption of nutrients is highly tied to gut health. So gut is our second brain, and and we have something like over 10 times more different types of bacteria in our body than we have cells. And there's a lot of cells in our body. So gut health is very important. And mushrooms and bacteria, which are two of these kingdoms that I mentioned, have this synergetic relationship. And a lot of fermented foods, I mentioned beer, wine, and, and kombucha, but they have this relationship with yeast and fermented foods that are good for the gut. And mushrooms and fungi have this very synergistic relationship in many ways. But gut health, very important for cognitive function uh, and general health. And I would say that it should be on everybody's health strategy list is how to optimize for gut health. Okay, connect the dots to mushrooms though. So the consumption of what mushrooms, someone wants to take an action item away. It's like, okay, this guy's telling me that I need to refocus on my gut health. Makes a lot of sense to me. We're talking mushrooms. Connect the dots for people. How can they take the next step? What kind of habit can they develop or change about their daily behavior? A lot of people have recently started taking probiotics for good bacteria, basically adding good bacteria to their body. What a lot of people don't know is that it's very hard to benefit from probiotics unless you just had an antibiotic and your gut is like a clean slate for the better or for worse. So changing gut biome with probiotics is very difficult. What is proven to be more powerful is prebiotics. And prebiotics are fibers, basically, that are food for for the bacteria in your gut. So they're food for those bacteria. And mushrooms are a prebiotic. And in general, by the way, one of the most easiest ways to improve general health is eat more fiber. And that doesn't mean granola or cereal, but actually like non-starchy vegetables that have a lot of fiber. Mushrooms have this good dietary fiber. Dietary fiber is important for the digestive tract and the gut health. There's also a particular type of mushrooms like reishi or turkey tail that has these polysaccharides or polysaccharide peptides that really encourage really good bacteria. They're like super food for the gut and those can also additionally help with gut health. If you want to improve your gut, You don't have to take mushrooms. You can be exposed to fermented foods. Don't wash your hands too often. Try to be overly clean. You can eat a lot of fibers from vegetables. And then if you want to add some more is add spices to your diet. And then some of these functional mushrooms, they're all great ways. So for example, we make this mushroom chai latte, which is this caffeine-free, healthy, delicious paleo vegan chai latte and it has these healthy spices and good mushrooms in it for the gut health. So something like that once a day might improve our digestive system. Can I ask you to repeat what you just said about washing of hands? I don't think I caught the context there. Sure. So gut health is tied to bacteria. Bacteria exist everywhere in our body, but particularly in our largest organ, which is our skin. 
Skin is our largest organ. There's a lot of bacteria in our skin and it actually protects the biome of our body. So a lot of people overly try to wash themselves, especially with these synthetic chemicals that really discomfort the biome on our skin. And that further jeopardizes our immune system and our general bacteria in our body. So besides gut health, the skin is a major factor in our biome. And those are all very much connected. This is gonna sound silly. And I'm gonna jump from this point, I'm gonna jump straight into the entrepreneurial world, the building out of your business. But I just wanna stay here for a second because it's entirely fascinating to me. I've made this observation for the last 10 plus years. If you walk into the bathroom, a public bathroom, right? And let's say it's a men's bathroom. Okay, let's say somebody is just using a urinal, number one or something. I'm amazed, and maybe you're going to tell me I'm crazy, but sometimes I'm, it's not that I'm like some unclean guy, but I'm sometimes amazed to observe the behaviors of people. I'm hearing you talking about the washing of hands for people to simply do something. They don't touch anything except themselves on number one, just urine and people scrub themselves like they're going into the emergency room afterwards, like they're gonna operate on somebody. And I think this mentality, you kind of bring it up a little, and I don't know if I'm completely going off on a tangent, but it strikes me a little unusual, frankly. And now you seem to be laying a little bit of a case that maybe we are overdoing it. Yeah, and I think this is pretty much very well scientifically proven as well, so it's not that woo. -woo. But I'll just give an anecdotal comment. I um, In Finland, we have to go to the army. I went to the Air Force. There were tens of thousands of young men together with me in, in the army and Air Force. And pretty much consistently, every single person told that the healthiest they've ever been is after the time in the army. They've never been as healthy. And I can guarantee that the hygiene, we, didn't, we were not <laughs> washing our hands all the time in the army. We're mostly covered in mud and dirt and we were in the elements. Obviously, if your immune system is jeopardized or you're going to a surgery, then you have to be extra careful because your body is in a weak position. But I think a lot of the modern thing has took it too far. And I think especially for young children, I mean, there's plenty of proof that like C-section can really discomfort the gut biome and the biome of, of a child, but also children should allow them to get dirty and during that childhood build that immune system because the immune system is like a muscle like anything else we have these natural kill cells and phytokines you don't need to know all the names you just need to know that we have these internal security officers protecting ourselves from the viruses and pathogens that we're bound to meet every day you will never not meet pathogens and viruses and stuff so as a child you're really starting to exercise that muscle and continue it through adulthood is really important. That also means don't try to be overly clean. Um, and then getting, like I said, fermented foods and other things that also support the guy. Personally, I've not been sick for one day in 11 years. During that time, I've lived in eight countries. I travel all the time, never been sick one day during those 11 years. So, you know, it's interesting. You mentioned you were in the elements while in the army. Well, the elements would be mushrooms, right? I mean, you, if you're in the elements and you're out and about, you are being exposed just naturally, almost the mist situation. But hey, given your background, you also study chemistry. So you've got some, some deep background in many of the topics we're talking so far. At some point in time, you say to yourself, and I don't know how this happened exactly, you're going to tell me, but you want it to be more than just somebody telling the gospel of fungi to uh, friends and family. And you thought to yourself, you know, I can imagine a business. At some point in time, you thought that. So how did that happen? How did that switch flip? Growing up in the industry and about 13 plus years ago, I discovered a rare mushroom and won this innovation award for it. I ended up donating the idea to and the business to a university instead of running it myself because I didn't feel back then that there was a channel to change the status quo in health and wellness. It was dominated by large companies and the narrative was hard to control because the control was in TV. In 2010, started planning for Four Sigmatic that launched in 2012. And the change really what got me excited was the blogosphere that was just Web 2.0, how normal people without mass media could share information with each other for free or almost without any cost associated and more radical, non-conventional, but scientifically strong 
arguments and theories could spread more easily. And that got me excited. Now, obviously, what we're doing as well is another free way for people to share radical ideas or different opinions or new viewpoints on something existing. And that just didn't exist 10 plus years ago the same way. And and that got me excited. And I started thinking, how can I impact the global health and global consciousness the most? That sounds very esoteric, but I went through this. I'd worked in management consulting in between my uh, farming and starting this business. And I started breaking down and I figured what are the most impactful areas? And I mentioned them to you. That was a hormonal balance, gut health and in- immunity. During those areas, I looked at what are the best natural solutions for each one of them. And then mushrooms came up and and other some superfoods and adaptogens that we're focused on started working on it. Launched the business in 2012, brought it to the US in 2015, and built it to what it is today. The challenge was obviously creating a category or creating a need for something that didn't really exist. Like I wanted to get every American to drink mushrooms, and it's quite a radical idea to get Americans to drink mushrooms, even though our ancestors did it. You have to kind of start to think about that very uniquely and figure out anything from product development, how to make it taste good and still be powerful to distribution is like very few retailers. They don't still today don't have a section for mushroom beverages. So where does the product sit and how can you get the word out on two people on the topic? Let's go back to 2015 though. So this is the launch point in America. I assumed you came out of the gate with one product, right? Initially? No, at that point, we had already worked on the product line in Europe, and we had four products. We had one for the brain, one for exercise, one for sleep, and then one for skin or travel. The focus was mostly on two, because in in retail, for example, conventional wisdom says don't have one product, have two, so you have a better shelf presence. But anyway, so we had four products at that point, pushing mostly, focusing on two of them. So in 2015, you're pushing two of the four primarily. What's the trigger? I mean, you're you're the new guy on the block, so to speak. You're bringing a category that, you know, most people, if you walk into even a Whole Foods, um, maybe somebody in Whole Foods is already doing something mushrooms, but still you walk in and you got to say, hey, how does that unfold for you as a new guy in 2015? The entrepreneurs out there that might want to do something entrepreneurially entirely different than mushrooms want to know how you crashed the game. So first and foremost, I came to the US to spread the global culture on mushrooms because we had some initial success and validation product market fit from Europe and Canada. And especially the success, initial success in Canada, we felt that, you know, if it validated some of it. Obviously, Americans often think of that as a unique market, but Canada, we felt that was close enough that if it sells in Toronto, it can sell in upstate New York or whatever. That was our, our thinking. So we had tested some of our thesis, but still when you came here, you kind of had to start from zero in, in a way. And, and instead of coming here, like many foreign companies come and kind of do it on the side, I felt it was all in. And I moved the business from basically no taxation to California with the highest possible taxation. But it was important to be at ground zero. And, and Venice Beach, California, where we launched, was I, we felt that that was the ground zero and that was the lead domino. The challenge was, all, like you said, is nobody drank mushrooms. And if you're listening and you're thinking about a radical idea that doesn't really have a market or it's very niche market, I think it's the hardest thing you can do in life in general is create new rituals and create new habits. And now that we're approaching like new year, new me, and people go to the gym, building new habits is really hard. And very few of those habits stick, even if you're initially motivated. So instead of trying to build a new habit, started looking at why are not people using mushrooms and why isn't that a thing? And one of them was flavor. They taste very earthy. They don't taste like portobello, but they taste more like black tea. And it was a flavor that people didn't really enjoy in America. People don't like bitters. People like really sweet things. But there was two common exceptions. One is chocolate and one is coffee. A lot of people who don't like bitter things still like black coffee or dark coffee. So instead of forcing people mushroom tea or a mushroom elixir, mushroom coffee was created because it tastes like coffee. And instead of selling them the mushroom idea, it was more around, hey, 126 million Americans are trying to reduce their caffeine intake. They don't want to quit coffee, but they want to reduce. And over 30 million Americans 
every day have a negative reaction to coffee, be it heartburn or jitters or whatever it may be. So there's a huge demand for people who want caffeine and energy, but somehow don't always have the most positive relationship with coffee. And that was what we went after. Instead of trying to give you a new ritual, new habit that you had no clue of, saying is like, hey, do you drink coffee? Yes. Do you ever get heartburn or jitters? Yes. Or trying to reduce caffeine intake? Yes. Well, here's a product that does not take like mushrooms, tastes like coffee. It has less caffeine, gives you the same amount of energy. Are you willing to give it a shot? People are like, yeah, totally. And that was the way to go. So instead of trying to create something new, is trying to look at like what is an existing ritual or what is an existing habit or an existing need that you can improve upon and through that create something that has never been done. Now, was mushroom coffee a quick aha moment, light bulb moment, or was there a lot of testing over a lot of different ways to deliver the benefits of mushrooms, or did coffee come relatively quickly as an idea? The product development was easy because Finnish people consume more coffee than anybody else in the world, about three times more than the Americans. During the Second World War, we were attacked both by the Germans and the Russians, and during that time, there was lack of coffee beans. And people started brewing this particular chaga mushroom as a coffee substitute and thoroughly enjoyed it. And after the World War, the University of Helsinki started researching its health benefits and realized that it's arguably the most antioxidant-rich food in the world, where one cup of this chaga, quote-unquote, tea would equal to like 30 pounds of carotene antioxidant. So the idea to a Finnish person of upgrading coffee or using mushrooms with coffee was not that radical. And there was already some initial like companies or individuals who'd been testing with it, but it was more like, how do you deliver it to a consumer in a very easy way where the use case is easy, the flavor is easy, but also the efficacies are there. It was more around not the product formulation alone, but more around the delivery and the four P's of marketing, if you may. So you get to the States in 2015, you've got something that you think will catch. You know, for example, that Finnish people like it. You've seen some success in Canada, but here you are in the States, you've moved to Los Angeles, and now you have to make a dent. You have to get known. Was your first step getting retail distributors to provide the product or it was an online buzz viral that happened? What was it that kind of broke you out because we're talking about a business that in a couple, just a couple years, I believe you guys are doing eight figures in sales. So there's been a real trigger here. And I'm just curious a little bit more about how that initially popped. Like I said, we had initial success in Canada and Europe, but not all those things worked out. One of them was the need to create this coffee because Americans didn't enjoy the bitters necessarily. And there really wasn't a tea category in America. People are not used to tea drinking the same ritual way. The other one was that we had sold in retail, we had distributors and in Europe, every country kind of has its own language and labels and all that complexity. In the US, the good news is that you have one language, one market, even though states have some unique stuff, but in coffee and tea, not really. And we came here and brought the business and quickly realized that retailers are not going to carry mushroom coffee or mushroom products because there is no existing market for it. They're not going to bring a product that there's no demand for it organically. One exception was Whole Foods. One regional buyer really fell in love with the idea and she was a pioneer. So she gave us a shot with the premise that I will personally be sampling the product in the store. And she felt like I can sell it to someone who's never heard of it. So we launched with Whole Foods in Southern California and I would go to every store and sample the products myself. And that was the corner sweat equity. But at that point, I realized that it's easier to convince a consumer to buy it than a retail buyer. So I guess partly by force, partly by chance, we became a digitally first company at that point, moving from a more retail strategy to online strategy. And in the last three, three and a half years, that's obviously paid off as a lot of the digital marketing and e-commerce has exploded. And I guess we were at least in food and beverage, we were one of those first early on credible brands doing it. And still many of the current companies are still trying to figure out how to do it versus we had already been doing it because retailers didn't want to work with us. And then now that we gain traction on our e-commerce and, and receiving few best-selling products on Amazon, like best-selling instant coffee, 
now retail is approaching us because they see that we have a bestseller on Amazon and now the push became pull. As a complete novice outsider observing your world, I can't have a conversation about coffee or let's just say coffee distribution without thinking of the uh, ubiquitous green and white sign that controls every street corner around the planet, unfortunately, now. They did it 15 or 20 years ago, but they do now. Even in coffee-loving countries that had their old independent little cafes, unfortunately, the green and white sign is just about everywhere. Now, have they gone ahead and decided that mushroom-enhanced coffee is the direction yet? Are they competition yet? I didn't start a business to serve a niche audience. I wanted to get every American drinking various mushroom beverages and using their functional benefits because they're so proven by science that I think pretty much everyone could benefit from them. And initially, obviously, it's easy to shrug off. And I'm sure in the first or second year in us in America, the waves we created, they probably solely shrugged off as some niche thing. But then about a couple of years ago, we became the Amazon bestseller on instant coffee. And Starbucks has an instant coffee called Starbucks Via. And we started selling more than that on Amazon, also more than Nescafe. We also got a couple other bestsellers, bestselling cold brew, bestselling coffee substitute, hot cocoa. And I think those really caught their interest since there's also a lot more eyeballs on Amazon these days than there used to be before. It's obviously become quite the juggernaut and almost every retailer is worried about them and large brands are trying to figure out how to manage Amazon. So because of that, Yes, we're definitely on their radar and and the use of mushrooms and adaptogens as a trend is acknowledged from as like the main trends by Whole Foods and many other major PR outlets and it's on a lot of people's radar right now. So far they have not launched their own product on that space or tried to do anything that space, but we'll see when that happens. Well, usually when these big companies that are really big companies start to look around at some upstart that's gaining a lot of notoriety and a lot of viral word of mouth, uh, usually the way that they uh, solve their problem of not having a competition to that particular product, they usually solve it in a way where they show up at your doorstep with a big check and say, Tara, we want you. Yeah, I mean, we've definitely been approached by companies. Clearly, I'm right now too busy to have those conversations and <laughs> not really interested. But I'm not trying to put you on the spot. I'm just listening to the story, observing everything. It's quite fascinating. I love these kinds of stories, you know. Well, in the last year or so, Blue Bottle sold to Nestle. Chameleon Cold Brew from Texas, I believe, sold to Nestle. Intelligentsia and Stumptown, these third-wave coffee darlings, from Chicago and Portland, they sold to JAB, which is now the largest coffee owner in the world, who also own Keurig and Pete's and whatnot. In the last year or two, suddenly there is all this disruption in the third and fourth wave of coffee, as they often get called, and the large companies are struggling. And that's not just in coffee and tea, I believe. Last year, the large food companies saw lost something like $4 billion in market cap, I think think it's happening. I think consumers are wanting more transparency in food and beverage and smaller companies tend to offer that. Consumers are wanting better for you choices, better for you granola, better for you snacks, better for you beverages, better for you anything. And a lot of these small, innovative, agile brands are serving the changing consumer needs faster and more authentically than these large brands. And I think it's happening across the board, not just with mushrooms or coffee, but pretty much anything in consumer packaged goods and beyond. Yeah, that's a great point. It is a really fabulous point. And if people don't understand what you said, they should listen to it about 10 times. And the main testing ground for what you just said, the experimentation playground is Amazon. Like, you know, because you can go on Amazon as a new brand. And if you offer something cool, offer something that's useful, something that people like, wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. A couple of years later, everyone's talking about it. Before it was really hard to get quote unquote, distribution with the Targets and Kroger's and Safeways and Walmarts of the world, because it was few decision makers, few gatekeepers that were saying what is allowed and not allowed to be sold to mainstream America. Then e-commerce emerged. And while a great idea, it was hard for early stage companies to find traffic or eyeballs for these radical ideas because they couldn't compete with the marketing budget of Campbell's or Kraft Heinz or Nestle, Deno, whatever. Amazon is not saying it's perfect, but in a way kind of helps some brands solve that is 
They have a platform that reaches most of America. Anybody can sell on that platform pretty much with very low limitations. And if you do your job well and you have an interesting enough product with the right offering, right price point, you can reach a lot of people without really anybody saying, are you allowed or not allowed to sell it? As long as you follow the basic laws, there is no gatekeeper. The gatekeeper is the consumer, and that can help accelerate the change in society and certain product categories. As we think about product categories, I want to go back to something that you mentioned in the very beginning, because we talked about four categories initially, and then really focusing on two. But I as we wind down here, I want to bring up one last topic area because to tackle the food space, to tackle the coffee competition, to go into that niche, to establish yourself is one thing, but to also get into beauty. This is like competing with Kylie Jenner to some degree. And obviously she's doing fabulous with her business. I don't think we're chasing Kylie here, but yes, we were the first food product ever to launch with Sephora. So, okay, well, hold on. That puts you with Kylie. She's in Sephora too, I assume. Or yeah. She'll, she'll be bigger than Sephora. We're not a makeup company, though. We're trying to offer a little more holistic, better for you solution. But yes, we are offering people an ingestible beauty solution. A lot of people spend hundreds, if not thousands, of dollars every year on putting stuff on their skin. I mentioned skin being our largest organ, often the last place to get nutrients. But we also know that the eating for beauty is one of the oldest concepts in the world. And obviously, what we eat makes up on the cells in our body and this largest organ in our body, or also hair, nails, skin, eyes, anything, are impacted by the nutrients or the lack of nutrients in our body. Mushrooms are one of the most time-worn and scientifically proven for things for also beauty and it's used in skincare products for a long time by multiple prominent brands so it's not that surprising somebody who's spends time in beauty but this is another space we've kind of half randomly half consciously entered and it's it's again disrupting something big besides coffee tea and cocoa now also the beauty space let me keep you there for a moment because i just find this fascinating look i know southern california i can imagine you with product in hand, going to Whole Foods, creating a buzz, creating an audience. I can imagine people testing. I can imagine that. I can see that perfectly easy. How did you do it with Sephora? I mean, this is an this is a radically different direction. This is not the same thing. They approached us. We've both very organically been talked about by Vogue, Harper's Bazaar, W Magazine, a lot of these beauty fashion outlets. And it's been a buzz, mushrooms and adaptogens, kind of on the next phase of of beauty. Also, I think that industry is also waking up to more ecological, clean ingredients and more holistic lifestyle, how it's not just the stuff that we put on our skin, but also what we eat that builds that skin is waking up. So it was, you know, it's a perfect storm of the industry being in the right time, right place, but also our brand getting traction in there. Once you obviously look at the science, it totally makes sense. But initially, it sounds a little odd. Same way as it sounds odd that you will push your phone and jump in a car with a stranger that will take you somewhere. But same way now Uber or Lyft are doing quite well or that you rent your home to a total stranger who you'll will, you will never even meet necessarily. And it, right now, Airbnb is doing all kinds of crazy stuff. So some of the most obvious ideas are initially seems crazy or wild but then once you start to try them you're like yeah actually mushroom coffee or eating mushrooms and adaptogens for your skin makes total sense but initially it's just kind of crazy and that's why they're entrepreneurs i guess listen i love it i love what you just said again as i said earlier that people should rewind and listen to what you said on that one sentence they should rewind again there because it's very difficult for people to grasp what you just said if they haven't lived it And I think what's so beautiful about what you have built so far, and I see this across a lot of different entrepreneurs, I like to sometimes think I see it across myself a little bit, is that to take the chance to say, what is there in my life right now that I love, that I'm doing, that makes me so excited? And now I want to tell the world, and I want to share it with the world authentically, and then good things can happen. You are not going to win a large company by playing safe. 
you have to look at what are the things that you can compete if you don't have those financial or human resources to compete with these large stock analysts. And often the ways how to do it is be more agile, be closer to the customer, listen to their needs, but then also take chances. And I did not necessarily feel that there it's even taking a chance on mushrooms because I knew they worked and I'd spend a long time working with them. But obviously how quick, quickly and in what way people would embrace them. That was a bigger question mark. And would I have to go out of business before that happens? That was another question, but I believed in it, but definitely being an entrepreneur is taking a risk. But then you would also argue that there is a huge risk by not doing anything and stopping innovation and becoming stagnant and not staying close to your customers and not being transparent enough. That's a risk by itself as well. Yes, the opportunity cost people need to always think about. If you, you think you're being safe by not doing something, uh, not exactly. Yeah. And like I said, it's not just mushrooms and coffee. It's a million other things where we're seeing this right now. And I think technology and the two-way street of social media interaction of, between people and companies and com people and people and companies and companies is really almost speeding that process. It's not changing anything necessarily, just accelerating the speed of change and adaptation of new things a lot. In terms of my audience right now going out and trying something, making a purchase, of course, you make it very easy. They can go to Amazon, they can look up for Sigmatic and they will find your products. But is there a website you would like people to go to to check things out or you just wanted to go to Amazon and try? a particular product? And is there a first product that you think people should try if they're saying, you know, I really want to go down the mushroom coffee path. I've never done this. Where should people start? What should they do? Give them some direction. First of all, you don't need to buy our products. I just hope that everybody will give mushrooms a chance. And if you're curious to learn more about mushrooms overall, I build a 100% free mushroom academy. You just go to Google, type Mushroom Academy. There's three different levels. It will cost you nothing. And there's video lessons and quizzes on learning about the benefits of mushrooms for yourself and, and for the environment. There are also books and other resources that you can use. But you don't even need to buy. I just hope that people will be more curious about this kingdom that is so fundamental to all forms of life, including us humans. If you want to buy products, ours or someone else, I usually recommend starting with Rishi, which is the queen of all mushrooms. R-E-I-S-H-I. -I. It's a random Japanese name. A lot of mushroom names are from Japan. And the other one, the king of all mushrooms is Chaga, C-H-A-G-A. So those are the king and the queen kind of good starting points. And I recommend starting with coffee or cacao with these mushrooms because they are bitter. And like I mentioned, those are the two bitters that most people enjoy. So you can choose between king or queen and cacao or coffee. And those are probably the easiest ways to get going. And there's a lot of places where you can purchase them, our products and others. Hey, best of luck. Great story. Great taking a chance. You know, whether or not people have any interest in my world or your world or whatever, the point is, if you love something, take a chance and good things can happen. If you don't take a chance, then I guess you can just sit in the office cube and do whatever. Then one day you die. Exactly, Michael. And, and thanks for letting me share my story and the message of mushrooms to your audience. And hopefully people learned a lot as well. Thanks for uh, chatting. And hopefully uh, all these listeners got somewhat more educated on mushrooms and, and building a business like ours. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Thanks, Michael. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money and up down and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, trend following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.